All right, so welcome to today's faculty forum. We're talking about creating engaging videos. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we are lucky today to have Jeff Pollock and Bart Danielson who are going to talk about their different methods for creating engaging videos. Also, of course, as you have things to add, please ask questions. Please feel free to share your own tips because I know that several of you in here have created online videos for students for years. Um, so don't be shy about sharing your own information. And with that, I'll turn it over to y'all. Okay, it's really nice to see you all. It, it's fantastic to see you all. So Bart and I are excited to um, uh, facilitate this forum. And again, Bart and I have a few things we'd like to share with you all, but basically we'd like to make this um, a, a way to get your questions answered, provide the information that you want, you need, and um, basically draw on the collective wisdom uh, to see what best practices are regarding um, creating engaging videos. Um, so uh, I, I'd, I'd love to start, Barf, if it's all right with you. Um, does anybody have any very specific questions that you'd like to get answered? I, I'd like to make sure that we answer those. And so if you have specific questions, definitely just shout them out and then I'll write them down and then Bart and I will jump into sort of what we have in mind. Hi uh, Jeff, this is Chris Hitch and Bart, nothing on my end. Thanks, thanks Chris. Yeah, if, if nobody has specific questions, that's totally fine. Bart and I will um will go ahead with what we sort of have in mind, and then we can um uh, circle back. And if if folks have questions, uh, no worries at all. Looks like um uh, Sarah Sarah's wondering how to make sure students watch videos on time. Okay, good. That's a, that's a good question. Um, so let me just show you this really quickly. Share my screen and um. Beth, would you let me share, please? Or if you want, you can pull up the PowerPoint. I was just going to do that. Awesome. You can Thanks. have Here's permission on. now. Awesome. Thanks. So can everybody see this um, this PowerPoint, creating engaging videos? Awesome. Cool. Um, this will take about 60 seconds. Um, in the current context, as you know, um, students and to some extent professors are, are having difficulties with the online environment. Videos are sometimes disappointing and lots of college students are unhappy with the quality of learning and that is in short what this these series of forming is, forums are, are working to change. Uh, Delta is a great resource. They have a link here. They are actually offering to help record videos which is a great option. If you decide not to go to Delta for whatever reason whether it's social distancing or other convenience there are a lot of other options and that is that last link here um, where there are a bunch of free tools for online video. Uh, Beth is a great resource. She has tons of experience with this. And so if you have any questions, Delta, Beth, me, Bart can always be useful. Um, but in terms of um, in terms of videos, here's what I think about when I create videos. And each person on this call has a very different style and different approach to doing videos. Here's mine. And if it works for you, great. If not, that's great. Um, and, and if it does, fine. So um, what is the goal for the video? If you are going to be recording something that is going to be used over and over, so at the beginning of all my modules, I have a course overview and an overview of my teaching philosophy. Those are things that I do over and over multiple semesters. I like to make them evergreen. And so I pre-record them really nicely. I went to a studio over on the Daniel campus and did it. If that's an option, it's a really good way to keep um, those really high quality. Uh, additionally, there are, there are certain topics that we tend to all cover in classes and there, there are activities that we like to facilitate and there are lectures on very specific topics. Um, for those particular types of goals, I like to actually pre-record them nicely uh, so that they're evergreen and they look great. Um, so that's this part up here. Best practices for those? Short, five to 10 minutes. This is, this is not a typical lecture where you're standing in front of someone for 15, 20 minutes without taking a break. It's five to 10 minutes tops. In fact, most of mine are probably four to six. Um, I like to only cover new stuff. I never talk about things that they can learn from a book or get from a video. We want these videos to be something that is, is compelling and value added, not something that they can get everywhere else. This is really TED, TEDx, TEDx, TED Talk style. It's edutainment, for lack of a better term. And um, having said that, it doesn't need to be perfect. Um, there can be mistakes. You can stop. And if you have some editing issues, your, your students are going to be very forgiving. Um, but it is something that uh, I like if it's going to be repeated to be to be on the higher quality side of things. Another goal could be sort of a class logistics update, a feedback on a graded activity. I love to give video feedback. Um, 
it, it kills me to sort of write out feedback. Um, so I like to you know record a 15 or 30 second video being, hey, this is great. Here's what I liked, here's what I didn't like. Um, for those, it's just facilitation. I do that on Loom or I do that on media site, can explain everything. It's just you in the screen and maybe showing their stuff. And, and Loom is the one that I've used most often. Uh, the, the aim for that in best practices would be, it's just personal feedback and roadmap and tips would be would be the best practices. And then um, on, on the formal to less formal side, the bottom here, provide personal professional opinion on current events. Um, there's a ton of stuff going on with entrepreneurship right now. And so I just, you know, film on my phone or on QuickTime on my computer, a short, you know, 30 second, one minute video that I share with my classes. Um, it's personal. It doesn't need to be great. I don't, you know, I wear this type of attire and it's something that you want to share with your class. It's just a personal touch. And that is just usually informal. So in, in terms of engaging videos, that's my sort of hierarchy of what I think about. Um, if, if that is meaningful and useful, great. If that, uh, if other people have different styles, which I'm absolutely sure they do, um, that, that's fantastic as well. Beth does have this uh, both with the slides. And so I thought I'd share that just as a way to kick things off in terms of how we think, how I think about engaging videos. Um, I know Bart has, a, has a, a different philosophy as well. And if you've taken a look at the videos that, that he has, um, you'll see we have, we have a, a different styles, different content areas. Um, and, and that's the wonderful thing about these forums. Is that a, is that a pass over to me? Uh, pass over to anyone for questions or thoughts or, um, Bart, I, I know when we talked, you have, um, had some things you wanted to share as well. Jeff, I have a question. Um, I did look at one of your loom quit, um, clips and I have yes. I'm not familiar with the loom. Um, I was wondering why you made the decision to use loom instead of media site or poodle, which is in. Sure. Yes, absolutely. So, um, I like the functionality in loom. Um, it was intuitive for me, um, to, to use. And what I wanted is, um, I wanted for me to be able to be in the screen and I wanted to be able to be a small little thing in the bottom. And then I wanted to be able to show my screen and then I wanted to be a switchback for me to the thing that I was showing. Um, and it, honestly, it was just a personal preference. Um, uh, Poodle, as you know, and, and MediaSite all have very similar functionalities. It's just personal preference for me on Loom and it was easy for me to learn. Um, let me just address Sarah's point really quickly. How do you make students uh, watch videos on time? Um, within Moodle, I put the videos in there and I add a, for lack of a better term, due date that the students can check off um, if they have completed that particular activity in, in a module. Um, and by and large, people like those deadlines. So they can print sort of a calendar of when things are due during the course of the session uh, or the semester. Um, and so Sarah, that, that's been my workaround. Uh, if anybody else has, um, insights into how to make sure that um, students watch videos on time, definitely, definitely share them uh, either at, with the group or, and or with Sarah individually. Robin, good question. Sarah, good question. Um, Bart, what's your take on in, engaging videos? Well, um, let, let, let me share my screen. Can I, can I do that now, Beth? I just hit share screen. Does that Yes, you should have um, be able to do that. Okay. So, so, so first of all, let me just say philosophically, um, uh, Jeff puts himself in the videos, and I did that early on. Uh, I now try to avoid actually appearing in videos that I create. Uh, part of that, there, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is um, uh, I don't look as good as I used to. I don't look as good as Jeff. Uh, so I don't look as good as I once did, but I look as good as I, I look better than I ever will. And uh, that's a, you know, just the reality of getting older. And to the extent that I'm creating any content that I, I want to have that is durable, uh, and inter, intersperse that with content that is, um, uh, that is new, uh, I think it's a distraction for the student to look at 55-year-old uh, Dr. Danielson uh, in one video, and then immediately he turns over to, 
to 65 year old Dr. Danielson, who's not in a coat and tie anymore. Uh, it looks, looks very different. Um, so it turns out that your voice changes very little over your lifetime. You sound very similar at 65 to what you sounded like at 25, but your visual appearance actually changes very substantially. And so making a video that is going to be evergreen, um, that doesn't have me in it, has some advantages, if not today, then three or four years from now. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, that's part of the reason. Uh, another part of the reason is, frankly, I just find it easier. Uh, you know, I don't have to uh, be looking at the camera. I can have notes over to the side that I'm, that I'm reading as I change whatever the visual is that's on the, the page. Now, uh, you know, one thing that's clearly different about a, a teaching a, or, or using a recorded video relative to, to what we do in a classroom. In a classroom, uh, there are, you know, maybe an hour, an hour to fill, you know, 50 minutes to fill. And a lot of that time is spent oftentimes doing things that is in between delivery of actual material. So walking over to the whiteboard or, or uh, fiddling around with something on the, uh, uh, to, to, to get the, the projector to work correctly or who knows, but you know, things that, that, that are a little bit of a break, but that's not necessarily a negative. But if you watch the six o'clock news, there's none of that. There's none of this uh, taking 15 seconds to figure out a you know, transition from one thing to the next. So, so I kind of feel like the material that I'm putting up, I want to avoid you know, making them short really helps, but I, want, I don't feel like I need to have an hour's worth of content to do an hour's worth of, of material because part of that hour is gonna be the student clicking on the, the video, you know, getting set up, things that they would normally do um, you know, it can just be, I don't know that it's more efficient for the student, but it can be more efficient on our side. Um, so here in Moodle, I've got a number of videos that, that I've made, and you'll notice some of them, for example, I, I, I sort of got them all labeled and for this chapter and, and individual numbers, and, uh, and some of them are quite short. So this uh, 9.8 video is a minute and 14 seconds long. And it basically just, I don't think there's any, uh, I don't think we can hear it. So let's imagine well, maybe we can. Let me cut it off so that we don't hear value. it. Okay. So here I've got a, a, a something Bart, that I'm I, I don't know about anybody else, but I don't think we're actually seeing the video. You're not seeing it. We still see the chart. You still see the chart. I wonder why. Did you share the chart instead of sharing your whole screen? Possible. <laughs> so let me. Um, nope. It's hard to touch anything up at the top because <laughs> all of the. Okay. All right, so share the screen is paused, all right? Stop share, let's share again. Okay, so maybe we're seeing something. Can you see that now? Yes. Okay, so, so um, in doing this, you know, it's really very simple. What I've done here is taken a PowerPoint slide and just used inking and laid out what I want to talk about. But whatever I'm discussing, it's as though I had a pointer. I'm just going to circle the content as I talk and, um, uh, and then provide them with new information along the way. Again, you know, inking what is important at any given point in time. And, and, and the student, of course, is going to end up getting this PowerPoint slide without the ink on it, or they could, they could view it with the ink if they wanted to, but mostly they like to be able to print it out and just see the whole thing. But I've been able to talk them through it here. So this is, this is kind of one kind of uh, uh, 
presentation that I'll make is to you know give talk about a particular topic, and it's actually a very low tech kind of solution. I say low tech; it's it's a pen, you know. Um, then there are other kinds, and I may run into the same issue here. Let me. Are we still seeing the same thing? Let me. Now we just see that the presentation ended. Okay. So. So here's a, a, a little different sort of situation. This is actually students' favorite part of the class is when they have homework assignments, um, there will be instances where they get stuck because the problems, you know, become increasingly difficult over time. Uh, and uh, the last thing that I want is for anybody to send me an email at 10 o'clock at night and have to wait until 8 the next morning to address a question. So early on, I, I basically had the philosophy that if a student asks a question, there's something wrong. Uh, now, I realize most people uh, in the classroom, if nobody's asking a question, there's the feeling that uh, it's kind of a dead situation. But I think my students are mostly working at 10 o'clock at night, and I'm in bed when they start to work. And, uh, and so with that in mind, I don't want them to have to, to and in my class is, is intentionally asynchronous. I made that decision along the way. Um, when I was going to have a large number of students, that it was going to be easier to do it asynchronously in the long run. So the students will have a problem to do. They can't work it. They can go click on a hint that shows them a very, very similar problem. But the important thing is it's not graded because students don't want to do a graded thing wrong. But they're willing to do an ungraded thing wrong if they are, if it's going to teach them something that will allow them to go do the graded thing and do it correctly. And so in these kinds of videos, and it's, again, it's pretty low tech. All I did here was I took a, um, I scanned a, you know, a, a, on a yellow piece of paper, I pulled a ruler out and created a, a timeline and scanned it and cut it out and, uh, um, you know, used the cut, the, I don't know what it's called, the snip feature and stuck it on a Word document. So what you're looking at here is a Word document with an image on it. And, and then I uh, just, uh, whoops, now I can't see it. Maybe you can. Can you still see it? Now we see, uh, no, now we're at your list of videos. Oh, all right. Well, what happened? That's, that's what I want to get rid of. Um, well, in any event, hey, I don't know that I, you know, not to slow things down. The, um, uh, the student now can see, you know, they can, they can, go figure out what it is they don't understand by seeing a similar problem being done. And that allows them after they've done that, and they don't, they don't always go to those videos, but for every, every problem that they've got that they have, that they're graded on, there is a hint somewhere that addresses, that makes sure it addresses any question I've ever gotten for a particular problem. And so over time, you know, now nobody ever asks a question because, you know, we've had a couple thousand people roll through that class. Somebody already asked the question before, and we've made sure that the hints address those kinds of questions. And students like this because it's just in time. They don't watch it if it's not valuable. If it is valuable, it's there when they want it. They don't have to wait on an email to come back for me. Now, in terms of, um, uh, and so, so the technology is pretty simple there. But the, the organization of the course is what's important and is giving the students what they need when they need it. Um, and the, uh, the, 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 in terms of getting people to watch the videos, there are two kinds of videos. There's sort of lecture videos and there, there are problem hint videos. The problem hint videos are just there if they need them. You don't have to, you don't have to, they're not required to watch them. Turns out they love them anyway because it solves a problem for them. The lecture videos 
Um, I, I want them to watch. I want them to watch before they attack the kinds of problems that they, uh, they need to work. And the way I've dealt with that is I created in Connect, where the graded homework is, I created in Connect a one-sentence quiz called the Lecture Check. And at the end of the chapter that we're covering, the first thing they do when they go over into Connect is they go to the Lecture Check and it's just a yes, no question. I attest that I viewed all the lectures for this chapter. And uh, if they answer yes, they get, they get some credit. In fact, the total amount of credit they get over the entire semester is 2% if they do them all. So, um, and if they, if they don't do it on time, I still want them to do it. So I, I, I give them, um, it's 10% off for every day that they're late. Because I found early on that if I didn't give them credit for, do, students won't do anything that they're not giving credit for. You don't give them, that's how they know that we actually mean that they ought to do it, is that we've given them some sort of credit. Um, so, so this little 2%, it seems like nothing, but almost everybody watches the lectures. Uh, and it made a huge difference in viewership as soon as I gave some credit for it. Um, one of the things I also did early on before I gave credit was I monitored which lectures people were watching and which ones they weren't watching. And when students quit watching lectures, sometimes I would see a commonality. I would go back and look at the lectures that were the three or four lectures before that lecture. You know, the, and they're only, you know, four minutes long. You know, some of them are really long. Some of them are, you know, maybe 15 minutes. But I'd go back and look at the lectures before they stopped and find out, all right, what was it I was doing that, that disengaged them so much that they just quit watching? And I went back and redid the number of lectures. But that was basically how I figured out what to redo is I figured out when they were becoming disengaged. But, you know, after that, you'd still have some people who were, you know, some of your better students, some of your worst students just, you know, they often wouldn't watch the lectures. But as soon as that 2% went in, they knew, oh, those, those, those lectures must mean something. And they started watching. Um, and I really haven't had a problem with them not watching. I will say this, one of the things I do, because it's only 2%, and, um, but I tell them in the syllabus, the lectures are, um, uh, you know, you're self-reporting whether or not you viewed them. And I'm not going to check unless at the end of the semester, you're just barely making a certain grade. So if you've got a 91, and if you didn't watch the lectures, you had an 89, right? If you're just barely making a grade, we're going to go back retroactively and view the and, and, and audit whether or not you actually did the, the lectures. So if it doesn't matter whether you cheated, you won't get caught. But if it does matter, then we've got a way of catching it. And by the way, we'll also send you over to, you know, that's a that's a uh, an honor code violation. And uh, so, you know, I've got some other assignments where there's just a tiny little bit of credit. I know people could cheat. There's some true false questions that the whole semester they 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 get about 200 true false questions, um, and uh, it counts three percent of their grade. So they always complain it doesn't count enough. Uh, but uh, and this is getting off of the the videos a little bit, but it's a similar sort of concept. They always complain it doesn't count enough, but you know, the problem is I know those true false questions are all out there already. Anybody who wants to cheat can cheat. So I want the, the, the credit that people are getting to, given to be big enough that they will do it and small enough that it isn't worth cheating. And then I also tell them, hey, by the way, if you want to cheat, here's data from a prior semester where we see that students that got 100% on the true false actually got lower overall grades than students who got 80 to 99%. Because we know the people who got 100% got it because they cheated, okay? So you're just cheating yourself. You know, the digging around for the solutions to these true faults is part of the, you know, is, is actually gonna make you better at all the other stuff that's counting a lot more. Uh, so, uh, you know, that one of the principles there though with the lectures 
give a little teeny weeny bit of credit. Don't give too much, just give a little bit and that tells people that it's, it's worthwhile. Bart, one, one thing I really like about your approach is that it is suited really well to the content that you're teaching. And so if you think about the entrepreneurship content that, that I'm sharing and the numerical focused uh, content that you're working on, I think you've come up with, with a really, really good way to both provide that content in a way that's um, appealing to the students. And I love your frequently asked question um, videos. That's awesome. The, the um, I will say this, that it is, I, I, I agree 100% that the content largely dictates what you need to be doing in terms of the sort of delivery method or, and, and I, you know, the, the term best practices gets bandied around. That's a term I really hate because, because I don't think there is a best practice. There are a lot of good practices and and it turns out that, that uh, and, and you know, you should never let somebody else tell you, hey, I'm going to come in and give you best practices and, uh, and think that they're going to make your content better because that may be best for something, but it isn't necessarily best for what you're doing. So you got to take that with an absolute grain of salt. For sure. Absolutely. Um, a couple of things that have been going around in the chat. Bart, um, I think had the question, are these numbered based on the chapter? Yes, the, I have, I've, I've got them numbered in the same way that the chapter is numbered. And the students are getting a, uh, um, now all the students have an ebook that is coming with the Connect content. So the problems are in Connect. It is linked in a way that they can actually go into the book and find where discussion of any kinds of problems or ancillary kind of discussions take place around it. Um, you know, I wish students would read from the beginning of the chapter to the end of the chapter. Like, uh, you know, I, I imagine that's what I did when I was a student. Maybe, maybe I'm fooling myself. Um, but uh, uh, I, I think that doesn't happen as often. And so the, the, I feel a need to drive, like with the true false questions, I'm, I'm trying to create true false questions that are, um, related to content in a lot of different areas within the chapter and it just forces them to go hunting down through the chapter and over the course of Saul, you know, of answering a dozen, 15 true false questions, they've touched every area in the chapter at least are familiar with. Thanks. Um, also, there was some questions going around in the chat about Jeff's Stembrite videos, which um, those are I, those are in the uh, folder, the Google Drive folder for those who are watching the recording. But Jeff, could you talk a little bit about what's going on with the chat in, uh, in regards to the Stembrite videos? Uh, absolutely. So um, Stembrite is run by Chris Carson, who's over on Centennial campus. Um, he's a, a friend and, and colleague. He has an academic background uh, in pedagogy. And so um, about, about three years ago, when the MBA program was trying to put some, some MBA courses online, um, I got m some money from the MBA office, Steve Allen um, and Nicole, to put some MBA classes online. And it was such a good experience that um, I, I put uh, my undergraduate classes uh, online and a couple one credit MBA classes. And so um, I got to the point where I could film about a dozen five to eight minute videos, as you saw in the chat, in, in about a half a day with Chris. Um, my videos don't take very much pre or post production. And so that was somewhere between, you know, a thousand or $2,000 or 1500 or 1500 to two twenty five $2,500. Um, if there's not much pre production and you are good with your slides and you just need to go in there and film, you can do it less expensively and in a shorter amount of time. So I can film, you know, if, if it's about a dozen, that's, that's roughly a whole class, um, you know, across th three, three videos per module times five modules is about 15. Uh, and then, my teaching philosophy and course overview are sort of evergreen and I just add them in. So um, it, it's great. Now I will say Delta has a very good setup as well. Um, and Delta does it for free. Um, and um, if, if Stembrite or Delta do not work, um, th there is no reason why someone couldn't do this on Mediasite or Loom, uh, Camtasia, explain everything. Um, th the main thing, reason why I use Stembrite is because at the time I was putting these videos online, I didn't want to have to learn the new technology and the editing software. 
And so I went in, I did the filming, Chris took care of all of that. That was my advantage um, two or three years ago. Now I will say Loom um, is is really easy and it, you know, Camtasia, I saw in the chat, a lot of folks have been using um, Camtasia. Is and The technology has come a long ways. Um, and so you can focus on the pedagogy and uh, conveying what you want to convey to the students and also not get bogged down in the technology like you would have a few years ago. Um, so that, that's been my experience. Um, if I were going to do it today, I still would go to probably Stembrite or, or Delta just because um, I, I like the experience of just you know, conveying the content and having experts deal with the technology. Um, but uh, you know, as, you, as you saw in the, in the Google Drive folder, I have done um, a fair bit of Loom and you know, uh, just QuickTime is fine as well. One of the things I, I think I will probably change going forward is um, sort of the the uh, the syllabus kinds of the beginning of the semester. We're always kind of trying to get people to move through the technologies, understand the technologies, and so I have done a number of videos that just show the students, for example, um, how to use Moodle. Right now, now they pretty much all know before they show up in my class. But in the summer, I actually get some students who haven't, you know, who aren't students here, and that's valuable to them. But, but one of the things that that always happens early on is is, is the syllabus, pre presenting the syllabus, and I have a number of little videos for that. And then I give in in you know, I give a syllabus quiz. Uh, it really serves two purposes. One is to make sure they're viewing the syllabus. And the other is to, to actually make sure they're touching all the technologies before they get to anything real. And so if something goes wrong with the syllabus quiz, no big deal. Um, and, but I use that to kind of get everybody up to speed. But the, um, the thing I think I'll probably do differently is I'll probably use Zoom uh, at the beginning of the semester to, to, to talk through the technologies now and to talk through the, the syllabus in a way that in the past I've used videos. And I'm not sure that, that Zoom isn't a better way to do it. And it does allow me to put my face in front of people, um, but I want to sweep my face out of everything that comes after it so that they're not making comparisons sort of thing. Yeah, and a, a good rule of thumb, doesn't have to be a best practice, but a good rule of thumb is that if you are presenting, you know, a video that is about creating a connection with the students, then be on camera. But if you have a lot of other stuff that needs to go on the screen that they should focus on, like working problems or showing how to use a software, um, walking through a website, you don't need to be on screen for that. And in fact, research shows that it doesn't add anything. It can be a detractor. So um, camera on for when you're trying to make connections, short videos, things like that, but camera off when you're trying to actually present content so that they focus on the content. Um, there is some information going on in the chat. I'll just mention really quickly about what technologies to use to record. Um, and I'm going to throw in my totally unbiased opinion here, which is that explore different technologies and pick the one that you like. Um, the reason that we tend to push media site, my media site, and Zoom is because they're supported by the university. Um, so if you need help, you can contact Delta or you can contact me and, and there's someone here who kind of knows what they're talking about. That doesn't mean you can't use other technologies that you like. If you like QuickTime, if you like Loom, if you like whatever else. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention the Poodle recorder in Moodle. It's built into the WYSIWYG editor. So anytime you're writing a discussion forum post, anything that uses the, um, you know, the, the, the bar that has all the options of things you can put into a written space, you can also record a quick video on the fly and it drops right into the Moodle content. It doesn't have a lot of editing capabilities. Um, but to use what works for you is what I always say. Um, Can I throw so, something in here? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, now um, I use my media site. Now, originally I went in the studio because I was on the camera too. And, and uh, but I use my media site. But the other piece of technology that, that I have found useful is, while right now I'm talking, I'm using a laptop here, uh, I actually have a, I don't know what it is, a 24-inch monitor that is, you know, a touch monitor um, that I use when I'm recording stuff. 
And, uh, and the reason I do that is because on, um, uh, on, media, on my media site, you can, you can identify a space. You, know, you can say, give me this window within the screen, not the whole screen, but this window within the screen. And so I'll create a, a window that is the size of, you know, that is formatted to the right uh, vertical and horizontal, uh, you know, the right width and right height, but it doesn't take up my whole screen. And the advantage to that is, like, if I'm work, if I want to work something in, uh, show them something with Excel, I can actually have Excel opened up and already, you know, half the problem halfway done. And it's just over on the other side of my big screen. It's not in the part that's being captured by my media site. And when I want, when I want, when I want to use it, I'll just reach over and drag it into the screen, into the, the screen area. It takes one second for that conversion to, to happen. It's a little something that's a visual cue to the student and okay, we're switching what we're doing here a little bit. And then when I'm finished with that, I'll just, and I can ink on that. When I'm ready, I can just drag it right out again. And um, so any kind of little illustration that I want to make, I can already have it preset for when I want to bring it in and just drag it in and drag it out. I find that to be, very, you know, knowing I can do that, I find to be very helpful. So I'll frequently have maybe just the PowerPoint inside the, the area that is going to be viewed by my media site, but I'll have other things to bring in and talk about, drag in and talk about. I can le leave it just on, either PowerPoint or if I'm working in Word, that's what I'll be capturing most of the time. But I've got this other interesting stuff that, that I can pull in. So that's the reason to have a bigger screen. And so I've got space to see what I'm doing to actually work in my media site, it, it, you know, without, you know, I got fat fingers. I, you know, I, I need to have a big enough screen that I can actually ink what I want to ink kind of thing. Um, and um, so that's that's a technology that's not the software; it's a hardware uh, fix that I've chosen to use. Yep, that's a great point. Um, there's also some stuff in the chat. Just Robin mentioned that with recording with Media Site, it the Media Site player gives the students the control to minimize portions of the recording. So if they don't want to see you, they can minimize you. So that's one thing um, you can do. Also, want to mention I don't remember if it was on. They speed me up too. Sometimes and they, they can speed you up. Yeah, they speed me up, so I don't worry about you know talking too slow. If yeah. if they're not happy, they can just speed me up. Yes, that's a good point. In fact, um, I highly recommend speaking a little bit on the slow side for those you know people who do need it slow because they're taking notes or whatever. But yes, there's now there's tools built into almost every player that let them speed you up. Um, and, and if you have not discovered that yourself, it's very helpful when you have to watch these playbacks of, um, let's say, the chancellor's messages that you're trying to get through very quickly, um, things like that. Um, I also want to mention super briefly that uh, for those who don't know, um, not trying to scare anyone, but they did do a content capture review this spring to determine what um, content capture system they want to go with in the future. We've been using MediaSite for many years. Um, and this year they are doing, a, I don't remember what they're calling it, a, a break it or a, they're not calling it beta, but something with um, a system called Panopto. And okay. assuming that it all works well, then we will be moving from MediaSite to Panopto for um, the 22 we're in 2021. 21, 22 school year would be when we're transferring. Everything media site is supposed to work with Panopto, so we're not going to lose all our old recordings or anything like that. You won't have to change your behavior in the classroom, but for those of you who are recording on a desktop, we will be switching systems. The um, Panopto system, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, is supposed to be much better. So for those of you who are complaining that like the editing is limited with my media site or it's slow, um, there's a lot of new tools with Panopto that are supposed to work better. So just an idea that that's on the horizon. It doesn't mean stop doing what you're doing with MediaSite this year at all. Um, but um, for those of you who are trying to decide what should I learn, I don't know if that would yeah. happen to you. Uh, Pan Panopto has a 30-day um, free trial um, if, if, you, if you are inclined to think about it and are looking to try something new and interesting.
What, what questions can we answer? So there is a question about um, addressing the captioning challenge using oh. different video recording technologies. I don't know if either of you want to comment on that. Yeah, so um, uh, I have filmed my videos and then uploaded them to YouTube. YouTube has a pretty decent feature that provides a transcript of the um, actual video. And so again, th that's not trans, that's not captioning, that is a transcript. Um, I just got a um, grant. It was, it, it took me about 30 seconds to apply for and I received a grant uh, to do captioning for MIE 3810, which is the um, intro to entrepreneurship uh, undergrad class required for all BS and BA majors. Um, it uh, took me, you know, uh, five minutes to upload the videos to three play media. Um, and it was like $160 to do the captioning. And I submitted the invoice to Tuesday across and she paid the invoice. And so um, if you are looking to get your videos captioned, uh, Delta has grants available for those. And for a whole class, it cost me, you know, less than $200 um, and Tuesday paid it. Um, and so if you're, if you're thinking about doing captioning, um, I highly recommend it. Um, and it's super easy and relatively time efficient and inexpensive to do. Um, I, I do see a lot of students um, on my YouTube videos looking at the um, transcript function in those. And so uh, whether they're using the caption as they watch the video or not, or just looking through the transcript uh, as I'm talking is, I think might as well have both. I, I recently um, added captions to videos that had already been done because um, because I got a, a, a notification that I had a student that had a hearing uh, issue yeah. that was going to be taking the class in summer two. And um, you know, I, I'm sure Delta doesn't want me to say this, but I just asked them to do it and, and they did it. I didn't pay anything. I didn't get a grant. Um, I'm not sure that's the norm, but it may have been because I had a, a, an urgent issue yeah. and uh, it's an online class already. All right. So it's something that, Delta maybe thinks of as something that they own in a sense. Uh, yeah. They, you know, they were they were very accommodating. To, to, yeah, and, and my guess is Delta actually got reimbursed from that through the captioning. That's very possible. Process because they, I think, they have yeah. a deal for captioning for some of the online classes. Yeah, um, it, Delta has a really good um, uh, set of folks who uh, will do a course audit for you in terms of accessibility. Um, and uh, similar regard, I had a student in my, in my class who uh, needed a certain format for what I was doing. And um, I worked with a great um, staff member over in Delta and uh, here are the things you need to do and here are the action steps to take and here's who to contact. It was fantastic. Um, what other questions can we answer? This is good. Um, I'll jump in. Has I, I recently uh, attended a Delta workshop um, on PlayPosit? Has anybody used PlayPosit in their their videos uh, that could talk a little bit about that experience? If you don't know what it is, it's it's. I mean, it's. I'm just scratching the surface in my description. I mean, it's a pretty robust uh, product. Um, what I was hoping to do. I mean, uh, my. You know, if I'm teaching, say, in the auditorium, my lecture style, you know, included using Top Hat pretty frequently to poll students um, and just to gauge their engagement and uh, figure out what I needed to talk more about or we could move on quickly. Um, and Play Pause it is a will allow for uh, the insertion of polling questions in an existing video. So you could take a video you already have made and then through an editing process, insert um, polling questions, which you know, a variety of different question styles, uh, probably not as many as you, know, you could do like in a media site Moodle quiz, but you know, more than just multiple choice. Uh, um, and if you wanted to you know, grade them, uh, there's a, uh, a linkage directly into the Moodle gradebook, which is also really attractive. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just wondered if anybody had any, any thoughts on that, uh, uh, cause I would be curious to hear your experience. 
Well, since no one's spoken up so far, I will mention yeah. that um, John Kaczynski, who does business law and business life sciences courses, uses PlayPosit extensively. Um, so I would hit him up if you want suggestions and tips. And maybe if he gets enough people hit him up, he'll do a, a workshop or something for us. <laughs> Yeah. Good question. So, so presumably everyone will put some videos in some form online. What are, what are folks thinking about using in terms of technology? Yeah, the, the, the um, since we didn't have an answer, I, I, the, the, of course, I would explain the technology that I'm using, but I, I am, you know, updating periodically uh, content. And one of the things I do in that updating is I, I typically will update um, even while the semester is going on. But when I do that, I, uh, I tend to start at the back of the you know, at the last day's content, and I work forward from there to the uh, to the front of the class. And at some point, the class and I intersect. And um, and when that happens, uh, I I roll my class over to the next semester and keep going. Uh, but that allows me to sort of provide you know relatively current content. Uh, and, st and I'm not struggling to try to keep ahead of them from week to week. I'm just saying, all right, over the course of a couple of semesters, this thing is going to be you know, updated in a, you know, in a number of elements. And this is how I choose to do it is work back to front. Um, you know, that may be just an idiosyncrasy. I see the world differently. <laughs> Um, and so while people are thinking about their technologies, I'm going to recap some of what's going on in the chat. Um, there are a lot of questions going on about captioning. So um, as Sarah and Jeff pointed out, one of the quickest ways to have, um, it's, it's called captioning, but really what it is is automatic transcription. So one of the easiest ways to do that is to either record with whatever tool you want and upload to YouTube and turn on closed captioning. Um, another alternative is to record with Zoom. If it's played in the cloud Zoom player, it will have an audio transcription um, created for it. And then secondly, is if you don't want to host it on YouTube or you have an accommodation and you want to ensure that the students are getting completely accurate captioning, apply for the caption grant. Um, uh, Crystal, who is the OIT captioning, uh, sorry, the OIT accessibility coordinator has told me she has yet to turn anyone down, right? They do not have enough requests that they have used up captioning grants. So um, apply. The hardest part about it is that you have to be in charge of the process and then you get reimbursed. Um, but it's just that it's really not that big of a deal. Um, and I think that was everything with that. Yeah. If I have a question for you, okay, so the suggestion is to load them up to YouTube, right? Does that mean the students will then be viewing them through YouTube? And you can a YouTube? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and if you put them on YouTube, um, Jeff can probably speak to this better than me, but you can make a playlist and then set it, you know, you, you, uh, you set it to that middle setting, right? It's not totally public, it's not totally private, it's, if you have the link, you can view it. I mean, I'm not too worried that people are gonna steal our proprietary well, content. The, re the reason that I ask that it ha has to do with, um, so for instance, if you're using McGraw Hills, whatever, their PowerPoints and working with those, th th that's okay. It won't cause a problem for, you know, if you're using somebody's textbooks or prompts from the, te I mean, they steal those already. <laughs> but, but, but besides that, I just, you know, I don't want to, um, you know, I know normally if you have something on a restricted website, like you know, Moodle at NC State, there's not an issue. If you go and put something out, I don't know if it's public or not, but just, I'd want you all to be sued with me. Yeah, so I, I would love it if someone else could speak up to this, you might have a better understanding than me because I'm certainly not 
the library's, uh, you know, general counsel's uh, person on on this stuff. But my understanding is, is if you don't make it public, it's not going to get caught by that web of that they are looking for when they're looking for content that's CC. Jeff, you're muted. Oh, yeah. So in in one of my videos, um, I have a clip from the um, from South Park where they are. Um, exploring a business focused on collecting underwear and then selling that underwear. So state phase one is collect underwear. Phase two is a big question mark and phase three is make a profit. And so I use that 15 second video to illustrate the notion that you have to understand both what you're doing and how it's going to make a profit. And that middle part is really important. And um, I did get an email from uh, YouTube that said, please take this, you know, private content down. So I had to sort of edit that out. Um, I did find a workaround, but, um, yeah, if you are just providing your content, YouTube won't have any problems. If you're showing videos or including video clips from popular TV shows um, and it's it's viewed by a bunch of people, um, YouTube might ask you to change the content or take it down. Um, but that's, you know, of 60 videos that I've filmed with Stembrite, that only happened once. And so, like that said, it's, it's a very small chance. I, I do have a technology, I guess I could show you. I use this uh, Wacom tablet to write on either Word documents or, and um, frankly, I find that really helpful what I, what I do. And I, don't, I don't think it's terribly ingenious, but I'll pre-write notes and such on the PowerPoints. And then as I'm talking, I can make additional adjustments. So if I'm doing problems, I can post, uh, I can actually video, I put the problem and then I walk through the solution. You can basically handwrite it like a student is doing. And that's being filmed while I'm actually doing it. And, um, you know, it's a good way, um, I don't know, it's maybe basic technology, but it works pretty well. It seemed to, the students seem to like it because I have a quantitative type class being taught. Donnie, did we answer your question? Are you still on uh, about um, YouTube versus media site in terms of hosting versus hosting plus video record? Yeah, no, that yeah, that that answered that question. But but in terms of actually even hosting, are there other advantages? I mean, like, is there any? I mean, is there any reason if media sites working to use YouTube other than tra than the transcripts? I've I've only used YouTube and so I can't speak to the comparisons. Um, I find YouTube to be pretty fast and um, students are pretty familiar with it. And uh, do do, we, do students have to log into media site to view them? Yes, they do. Okay, okay. So yeah, um, I um, just speaking on the fly here. I like YouTube because it's it's pretty fast and students don't have to log in anywhere to view the videos. But if you're using media site and it's working there's no reason to switch. Would, would that be true if you use the, so what I've done is taped in uh, media site and then put the link into Moodle. If you put the link into Moodle, are they still required to sign in to, to view it? I mean, I tested it, but it just seemed like you clicked on it and immediately opened up. Depends how you Pick add it. Up. Uh, so if you add it as a URL, which is the way that we used to have to add all media site videos, then yes, they are required an addition authentication step. Um, if, however, you're using the new built-in Moodle link thing that automatically, you know, where it lets you pick which video from media site and it's tied and it has the lovely little media site icon, then no, they don't have a second login. Okay, well, I didn't see the little media site icon. That's somewhere in Moodle, I take it? Uh, yeah, there's, there's three ways at least to add media site content to Moodle. So um, I have that information online somewhere. I'll try to remember to drop it in uh, okay, to the okay. thing. Good questions. What else can we be helpful with? Well, I'm not the shy type and I have another question. And I wasn't here for the first part, so you might have already answered this. Nice. But um, how many folks are using some sort of, I don't know, quiz or test 
attach the videos or something to ensure that students, or at least as much as you can ensure that they're watching the videos. Is that something that we should be considering? I, I haven't done it in the past, but I see Bruce shaking his head yes. So, but um, I was just wondering what, what are folks doing with that? Well, I mean, I'll jump in, Scott. I'll tell you, I, I'm not going to pretend it's the best approach or anything like that. But, um, you know, when we, when we, you know, pivoted or whatever in the spring, um, since I had, you know, started obviously with uh, the, the top hat questions as part of my lectures, and those were, um, you know, ultimately their performance was part of their course grade. Uh, when I moved to the online uh, format, I, I just developed a very short five question Moodle quiz for every lecture. Now that's, that's you know, the, think about a class, you know, so a, a 75 minute block of material. Um, and much like I did with Top Hat, which also was, you know, just serving as an attendance taking device. The first question and the, the first and the fifth question on this five question Moodle quiz were really just Hey, did you watch the video? And very simplistically, I just had a slide at the beginning and a slide at the end with a, a number between one and 99. And so, <laughs> Jot this down. Uh, this is going to be the answer to question one. And then, of course, question one had five choices. So they could guess <laughs> or they could, you know, fast forward through and pick up those numbers. But and then the middle three questions on the you know, on the quiz were just knowledge check questions from the lecture material, um, and I still in my recorded lectures retained those types of questions. Now uh, at, at that point, since I wasn't using PlayPosit and I wasn't trying to do it using Top Hat at that point, it was just recorded on MediaSide. Um, so I kept those in the in my recorded lectures as well. Just said, hey, commit to an answer, but I'd reveal the answer and we'd, I would talk about it as if I was having a conversation with the class, but then they would take this short Moodle quiz that I, I restricted in time to, you know, a two or three day window around when I expected them to be watching that particular material. Mm -hmm. That's what I, and I'm planning to do that in the fall Although now I'm intrigued by this play posit and want to at least see what that might do instead. Okay. Yeah. So we're out of time, but I do want to remind everyone there is the Google chat room for teaching online. So, or teaching. So feel free to continue the conversation there. Um, and as far as adding interactive elements, I do want to quickly say that there is play posit is in Moodle, but there's also H5P. So both of those are good techniques. They, there's different things you can do with either one. And Delta offers workshops on how to use them. Um, and I want to say thank you again to Jeff and Bart for leading this conversation. And thank you to everyone who's attended today. Um, I'm going to close the room. But like I said, please feel free to continue the conversation in Google Chat. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks,